Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, who are joining us for today's webinar on good manufacturing practices, GMPs. We thank you for joining us and always coming into our webinars. So we share knowledge and we share information on various aspects of our production. Um, this is what WAPCOM, the West Africa Competitiveness Program, Ghana component, working on three main value chains, cassava derivatives, fruits, mango, pineapple, cosmetics, and personal care products. The objective of WACOM is to enhance the competitiveness of Ghanaian exports through enhanced production, value addition, and producing in sustainable way in everything that we do within the three main value chains. Our webinar today is mainly, we're going to talk about good manufacturing practices. We talk of GMPs. So what are GMPs and why do we need it? And uh, we have our resource person, Fred Jamna, who we see ready to take us through. In a moment, we would uh, launch a, a poll and then the poll would give us a, a fair idea who is with us and what our expectations are and what we know about GMPs. That would influence to a large extent how a resource person would delve deep or would keep in a particular way. Um, so in the next three seconds, the poll would show up on our screens and I entreat all of us who have registered, who are in now to answer. It's very simple. So the first question is how familiar are you with the term GMP? The second question is, do you work with any established code of practice that guides your operation? It's a yes or no question. If yes, do you follow the established code in your work processes? Yes, fully, yes, partially. Good, so please answer. Yes, we see the answer. Yes, it gives us enough room and it gives us a fair idea. So those of you who are still joining us, we welcome you to today's webinar on good manufacturing practices, GMPs. And so, yes, if you, if you, you follow, you have an established code, do you follow it pro, uh, daily in your work processes? Yes, it means you do it fully, partially, or sometimes we have various codes, but we do not follow. I mean, uh, it gives us a fair idea to know what the challenges are, and it also helps Mr. Jamna, who is our resource person, to encourage us all to find out what code you've established that you are not able to uh, <laughs> Follow. Sometimes we all set codes that are above us, and so he would guide us and make us understand. Yes, yeah, so those who are joining us, today's webinar is on good manufacturing practices, GMPs. Without GMPs, we run the risk of contaminating our produce or the risk of doing something that is really not required. There might be mixed up even in something that you produce in your own backyard. So it's a very important aspect of food quality and safety that we're going to discuss. So soon the results would pop up and after the results, Mr. Jamina Fred will now take us through detailed presentation. So waiting for a few seconds for a few other colleagues to tick the boxes. I encourage you all to tick and it gives us a sense of direction to know who we are. Usually if it was an open face to face, we would have boxes and say, write your expectations. So this is also gives the trainer the kind of expectation also to have from us. Thank you all for taking up. So the results is coming up. Super. So how familiar are you with the term GMP? Very familiar, we have 50%. Somewhat familiar, 36. Not familiar, 14%. Do you work with any established code of practice that guides your operation? 57% say yes, 43% are saying no. Well, the interesting part is on question three. If yes, do you follow the established code in your work processes? 29% of the 57% who have established their code say yes, they follow. And 57%, an overwhelming figure, say they follow partially and 14% say they don't follow. I guess if we had asked how partially, to what extent is the partial following, then it would have also 
brought us a different answer altogether. But at least this gives uh, Fred a fair idea of uh, who our attendees are and how we perceive GMPs. Without taking too much time, we thank you all for subscribing to today's webinar. You are welcome. I won't take the wind out of the seal. So I hand over to Fred to tell us what the GMPs are and what we need them and how to implement them. So Fred, thank you very much and have a wonderful time with our attendees. Hello, can you hear me? Good yes, morning. Yes, we, we can hear you. Good morning, Fred. Charles, uh, <clears throat> permit me to just run you through our uh, program today. I'll give you the content, what you want to do. So some few words by way of introduction to good manufacturing practices, which from now we're going to refer to as GMPs. Then the second session will take you to some practices, we are talking about employee practices that are good. And then I'll give you some examples. Then the third session will talk about production or manufacturing practices. We we'll focus on storage, cleaning, sanitation, housekeeping, things like that. The session four will talk about how we receive our raw materials, our packaging materials, the handling, the storage, and then the shipping or the dispatch. Then finally, I'll give you some reference material which is very important in this discussion. Uh, permit me to start with some few thoughts of mine before I even go on to the presentation. Good manufacturing practices, you normally say, are part of the business owner or the processes, processes heritage. Best employee practices, best raw material supply, best equipment, state of the art processes and technologies mean nothing. I'm not seeing the presentation. I'll bring the presentation very soon. Okay, all right, that's fine. Yes, these are just my thoughts so that if you don't take anything away, at least this opening statement will linger on your mind. They mean nothing if they are not used in the right way to ensure food safety and quality. And therefore, the need for this uh, webinar, Introduction to Good Manufacturing Practices. Now let's go through the presentation that we put on for your discussion. Good manufacturing practices. You know, we started by asking you a few questions. And the answer indicates that the majority of you are familiar with the term good manufacturing practices. And we are saying practices because you know there are other goods or guides that will normally help us uh, come up with good quality wholesome or safe products. What is your... <clears throat> but trying to put some things in perspective. In recent times, we are all witnessing a growing awareness by consumers because consumer awareness is becoming very paramount in most, almost everything that we do. It is becoming serious concern for processes or operators along the value chain. All the three value chains, I must say. Conformity assessment, because we're talking about those who will assess our products, our processes, and then give the attestation. Exporters, as well as importers, are also becoming very, very much aware of the importance of food hygiene and safety, which is also a component of good manufacturing practice. And why do you say this? What is the implication? We are saying this because you all now know the importance of quality in the activities of the three value chain. You are talking about cassava, fruits, 
cosmetics and personal care products. There is an issue of compliance with quality standards. And I must say that if you are able to comply with this standard, then it's like you have the ability, the tool for facilitating your market access. And this underpins all the policy guidelines on health and safety, either food or non-food products. Report of foodborne illnesses associated with fresh fruits in particular and vegetables have increased. The concern among public health agencies and consumers about the safety of this fruit. Why are you saying that most of these commodities, I'm talking about fresh fruits and vegetables, are eating or you call them ready to eat. You prepare your salad, you don't cook and you eat it. So the health concerns are very, very paramount here. And also the prominence of food safety in primary production and manufacturing is becoming an issue. And almost everybody in the supply chain is aware of these concerns. Right from primary production to the final consumer, the necessary hygiene conditions for the production or the manufacturing of the food or the personal care or cosmetic, which are safe and suitable for consumption or use should be taken into account and should be taken seriously. The guidelines or what we call the code of practices that we are going to discuss are applicable to welcome target sectors, for example, the cassava foods and cosmetic value chains. It is very, very important for us to introduce you to this concept of good manufacturing practice. And now focus for this discussion is about good practices. We are talking about global or international practices. Some may refer it to as GMP, good manufacturing practices. In other documents, of course, we say good agricultural practices, gaps, we can call it good transportation practices, good hygienic practices, a whole lot of good practices, depending on where you find yourself in the value chain. All this is aimed at controlling microbial, chemical, and physical hazards that are associated with all the stages of production fruits, fresh fruits, vegetables, and cosmetics, right from the primary production stage to consumption, that's from farm to fork. And particular attention is given to minimizing the microbial hazards. Here we are referring to the risks associated with these hazards. What we are going to talk about is just to provide with a general framework of recommendation that can be uniformly adopted across the sector rather than the detailed recommendations for specific practices because we are having a diverse commodities, different operational practices, different standards, different technical regulations. But the bottom line is trying to control the risks associated with these processes. For instance, fresh fruits and vegetables in that sector, that industry, very complex. I said some of them ready to eat fresh, no processing. Others, you have to add value, turn into juice, nectars, and things like that. And in all this value addition, there is an inherent risk or hazard that should be addressed. And the way you handle the production process will determine how you address these uh, hazards or risks. Besides that, 
These are being produced and packed under diverse environmental conditions that will also contribute to either the reduction or the aggravation of these risks and hazards. Some provisions may be difficult to implement. That is why some of you said you have established schools, but you are not able to implement it fully. Agreed, there are difficulties in the implementation, especially in the areas of primary production. And when it is being conducted in small holdings and in areas where traditional farming is practiced, when you're talking about potable water, it's an issue. And if you are not able to assess potable water, you are rather increasing the microbial load, meaning you are increasing your risk, and therefore the risk of losing or being not able to meet the standard requirement. So therefore, the practice, whatever we are going to discuss by necessity, should be very flexible to allow for difference systems and controls and prevention of contamination for different groups of commodities and operations. So what is the objective of this webinar? The first is trying to raise awareness of the importance of quality or the application of quality standards and course of practices in the cassava Foods and cosmetic value chains. Being it good manufacturing practice, as the case may be, or good hygienic practices. But I must emphasize here all the kinds of code or the types of code, the foundation is good hygienic practice. Good hygienic practice that underpins almost all the code that you may find in literature or in practice. So let's look at the introduction. The scope, I said the scope is so flexible and it covers almost everything that we do. It is all encompassing, but you have to adopt it to your operations. You should also be able to address the regulatory requirements because I spoke to you about the awareness of conformity assessment agencies or organizations. They are very much specific for the type of production or operations that you carry out. It talks about the facility requirements because I said the control measures are not the same, the risk exposures are not the same, and therefore there's a very huge contribution from the facilities where you operate from. And therefore, there are stringent requirements to meet those uh, 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 standards. And then how you do your records, real-time record, accurate documentation, and the recording. There are guides to help you do the right thing. Several government regulations and the administrators are either Food and Grass Authority or Ghana Standards Authority or some other private or regulatory agencies. While this regulation may be broad, for instance, the code of practices that are prescribed by FDA or DSA, and there are other international codes of practices like the Codex Alimentarius Mission which is an agency of FAO, they provide more detailed code of practices or GMPs. But as an SME or an operator, that is why I'm saying it is your heritage and therefore you ensure how it is used and it is used properly. You are encouraged to provide additional company defined GMP requirements because you understand your processes and operations better than any of these regulatory agents. But all in all, you should consider the national requirement or the regulations. For example, if you take GS 
227, the part three, which is a code that is trying to regulate the cosmetic industry. This code will give you the list of restricted substances that may not be found in your cosmetic or personal care product. So if you decide not to apply this or ignore this list, it will be a very serious challenge and may even prevent access to either the domestic or the international market. In the area of fruits and vegetables, we have the Code of Hygienic Practice. And this is a coded document that can be downloaded free from their website. Where necessary for a given facility and or the production line, other applicable regulations may need to override the certain gene. For instance, if your production or your operation has a lot of impact on the environment, then you cannot go without complying with codes that are generated from the environmental protection agents. How you manage your waste, talking about pollution control, they will also request at least for a list of what your assessment, risk assessment, impacts and aspects of your operations should be part and parcel of your guidelines, your code. Most of these things should focus on particular programs and processes, or even the location. If your facility is located the place where always around June, July, you have flooding, then we have issues of how you control flood. Now let's look at the second aspect. We've looked at the regulation, we've looked at the location. To recap, your location will be such that it is free from flooding, dust, heavy pollution, and things like that. So that you don't have the challenge of trying to salvage your commodity or your product because the whole facility has been flooded. Now, employee practices. I said earlier, all these technologies and whatever will mean nothing if you are not able to implement them properly, especially when the employee, the workforce is not well educated, well coached, and trained. One, product tempering. You know, some of you always, when you seal everything, they want to open and even taste and see whether it's good or bad. Tempering, it's not allowed. And it is the responsibility of all the employees to ensure that whether the food or the cosmetic product is safe for use. Any intentional acts by any employee that could render the product, either the ingredient or the finished product, unsafe, should be prevented and should be part and part of the code that should be enforced. Now let's look at personal hygiene. The code should state clear in that employees must maintain high degree of personal cleanliness or hygiene. What are you talking about? People on kept fingernails. Hmm? It's not allowed. And in some instances, I'm giving away, we we'll put the do's and don'ts displayed in the canteen, the notice board, what should be allowed and what should not be allowed so that you can sanction offenders. You should also try to prevent contamination from the employees or your equipment or the way you add value. How do you do that? You do not eat or drink. Don't taste the product. You know some people do taste by dipping their finger in the 
consignment and taste, which is not allowed, chewing of gums and all that, not permitted, throat candies, not permitted, lozenges, not permitted. And you know, this thing they have, I don't know whether it's a toothpick that the young guys always want to dip into their mouth and, you know, all kinds of things. And then putting the pen or pencil or your marker behind your ears is not allowed. False fingernails, eyelashes, not allowed. And there's one thing that you know makes things very difficult, like you are wearing badges and ID. It should be below your waistline. It shouldn't be above the waistline. And if I walk around your places, it is likely I'll find a lot of people wearing your badges or your ID cards on your chest. But the permitted code is it should be below your waistline. You don't wear jewelry. It's good to have your gold plated wristwatch, but it is not permitted in you know, the processing environment. You should also control the traffic party. You know, this happens are people moving out and in the processing area, the stores not permitted. Proper housekeeping. And please, you should have a designated area for eating, at least a small canteen, well kept. You should have changing rooms or what we call the lockers. There are several examples from my experience that the company will provide all these facilities for poor hygiene, housekeeping, gone with the wind. This is not allowed. I'm saying that I've mentioned all these things earlier on. Employees to maintain high degree of what you know, cleanliness or right. This will prevent product contamination. And I've listed a lot of things that should be done to avoid that or to prevent product contamination. Now let's talk about our clothing and personal equipment. Now we call the PPEs, approved clothing. If you go to the hospitality industry, most of you find the shelves or the food service is not wearing white. Reason is simple. They want to assess the level of cleanliness. If it's dirty, everybody will see so obvious. So most will pick uniform on a proof clothing that you'll be forced to maintain it, ensuring that it's always clean. This is an approved clothing. You should not wear clothes that have several pockets. It is not approved. So there are guides for even selecting the uniform or the apparel for your employees. If you intend using disposable clothing, because in some instances where those were doing the milling and the mixing, you know, they sold their clothes and therefore there's a need for you to have some of these disposable ones. And when it is, you take it off and put on. And please try to find specific clothing for certain areas. For instance, where you do the milling, where you are decanting or mixing, where you have a lot of you know, spillages, please give them the appropriate clothing that will be suitable for that kind of process. And more often, the practice is just in industry is that we give them uniform with different color codes. For example, those in the engineering, plant maintenance, blue, 
where we call dirty area, dirty operations in the production of the manufacturing sector, either brown. And where you do the assurance of quality, you give the white. Production floor, white, just like, you know, a chef in the uh, hotel kitchen or a restaurant. Then also you provide the requisite PPEs, like a helmet, a bump cap, hard cap, and I've displayed a few of them here, depending on what you do, and the kind of footwear that, that can be maintained by cleaning from time to time. Offset, rings, watches, earrings, necklaces, and other jewelry, not the meter. And I must emphasize, including ornaments or piercing, you know, exposed body areas such as the tongue, the nose, which is common now in certain areas. Maybe here people frown upon it, so you don't see it often. But you see, excuse me, no offense to the ladies of three years or four a year. These are some of the things that you should avoid. They are not permitted. Employees who work in, if I mentioned GMP areas, that is high risk areas, please make sure that you wear only the company approved to them. Future local or facility regulations must be followed because some of these agencies, like the Food and Drugs Authority, when they are doing their inspection for registering products, some of the things they look is the way you implement some of these guys, the codes in your facility. They are looking at the workers, their behavior, attitude, housekeeping, and everything. So please, they will come and you focus on some of these do's and don'ts aspect of the code and see whether you follow them religiously. Clothing shall provide adequate coverage to ensure that the hair, so they say wear hair nets, hmm? or other foreign material do not contaminate the product. So unacceptable clothing would include, but not limited to shorts. You don't wear shorts where you have, you call it a nika or whatever, short pants in the profession. No sleeveless shirts, you know, like the boxers type of shirt that the youth want to wear to show their muscles. It's not allowed. Please. This clothing and hair gears must be free from potentially offensive marking. These offensive markings, you know them, it is not allowed. Just like we do not allow the wearing and jewelry in our operations. Now, hand hygiene. You see, even before COVID, some of these code of practices, the guides, it's enshrined in them. They need to wash hands, the frequency, and how to do it. The use of hand sanitizers, and the methods, and the control, and especially how you control the use of disposable hand gloves, hand lotions, and things like that. These are all enshrined in most of the codes of practices that we use in our patients. So how washing even started before or pre COVID in the factory or the production environment? You know the steps. Step one, and here I'll point out why you need to wash hands. If you see the picture there on wash hands, full of bacteria, germs, what you call germs. So we said step one, wash, wet your hands with warm. Here, there's a challenge. 
of experience and audit or inspection where the auditor insists that they should have warm running water for washing hands. Note that your question time, let's see how we can go around this requirement in our part of the world. They said apply adequate amount of soap. Wet it so that the soap can have very effective contact or adhesion, if you like. Rub your hands vigorously for at least 10, 20 seconds. Is it new? Are you only doing this because of COVID? These are practices, best practices in the industry. Clean in between your fingers and above your wrist. That's why you don't need to wear wrist watches and rings and bangles and things like that so you can wash thoroughly. You scrap your fingernails. If you are keeping very short ones, then there's no problem in scrubbing underneath your fingernails. Rinse of water. We're talking about running water to remove all traces of water. Soap. Yeah, we're talking about liquid soap. And please hear, there are soaps that are permitted for use in the food industry. Not any other liquid soap. There are prescribed liquid soap for use in industry. Please, let's take note of that. And you should be mindful of where you source these things for application in the food industry. Do not flick the water onto the floor. In some facilities, we have what is called hygiene junctions or hygiene places. But in some situations, we may not be able to put in place that. These are some of the restrictions, some of the challenges in having access to some very sophisticated markets, global markets, or even the regional markets. The sunny or the hygiene junction, the absence of that can pose a serious challenge to your operation. You dry hands of single use paper towel, where some processes will say it's expensive. If it's expensive, go for the air dryer. But that one too, you have a prescribed one. So look for the right one. The guys are there, the manuals are there. Let's do a search and procure the right one for the right use. Then we do the sanitization of your hand by dispensing some alcohol. And here, the standard prescription 70% alcohol base to your hands, rub it together, and allow it to dry. Now, let me show you what is not in this diagram, but there is a poster that Wacom is developing that will take it's a tutorial on procedure for washing hands because you will not have time to read all this long literature. But there is a tutorial standard procedure that you can paste at your hygiene judges or wherever you provided those facilities for washing hands. So uh, what are you talking about? You are talking about hand hygiene, hygienic wear, that's grooming, and hygienic behavior. This will constitute personal hygiene. And the details of this is in the code of hygienic practice, which is generic. It cuts across all value chain. The details and the requirements can be found in any of the code of hygienic practice. It's either from coders or from MDA or from GSE. It is available for you to refer to. Your hair, I said, it should be kept. Condition and accessories, the clips and all those things are not because you are going to wear Hair nets. Hair is changed. That's what we call it. Facial hair is a big problem of rudeness and audit. 
you know, the youth of today want to wear that well-groomed beard. If you want to wear that, you want to be fashionable, you may have challenges in working, especially in the food industry. Because the facial restraints are not available. I have had the cause to walk some young guys out of the production floor because all of them want to wear this. And I was preparing them for FDA US audits. And I know their regulations. So I said, gentlemen, either you go and do other jobs, or if you want to stay here, go and shape, clean shape. The ladies, Afro hair, long hair behind the neck, fashionable, but not for this kind of operation. Now, in GMP areas, I'm talking about high risk areas. The hair must be maintained, kept clean. There are several things that you can do to maintain your hair. And I've only said there's a few here. Okay? Go clean shave or you cover the exposed hair completely because you lose your hair very rapidly and these are the sources of all contamination. So please keep your hair in good shape. If you want to work and meet the requirements of the code. Now let's look at this picture. Very typical example of what I'm talking about. You are talking about you've done everything, now you want to pack it. And I'm using the fruits and vegetable example because a lot of work has been done in that area, including tutorial codes of practices. Now let's look at outdoor and indoor occupation. Say GMP for the cleaning and sorting of whatever you want. The picture on the left hand side. You see, everybody is wearing a hair cover. No jewelry. If you zoom in, you can check their hands just around their fingers. Check their ears. And you see how they fasten their garments to diminish or to reduce the risk of transmitting foreign body onto the vegetable or the food that they are packing. This is the kind of best practice I'm talking about. And it is not difficult to achieve this. It is here within our mind. Look at the work tables or the worktops, if you like. Clean. And here, did you see any garbage? Because they are practicing what is called clean as you go. You don't create the waste and leave it on the floor. As you create the waste, somebody is responsible for taking it away immediately. That is good practice. And here they are in the packaging area, high risk area. And it's called clean operation area. Now let's look at those who are packing in the field. The cartons, everything is sitting on the bare ground. And if you do that, the products are sorted in the third in unsanitary conditions. Their hygiene cannot be guaranteed because they are exposed to a lot of hazards, risks. Personal hygiene begins in the third. Washing hands before and after harvesting decreases the risk of contamination of your product. Beautiful product, but you end up contaminated. And the code adhering to the code, the guidelines to prevent all this. Now, diseases. For every operation, one of the requirements, which is also a regulatory requirement, is regular health check. You do the medical exam nation of your staff, your employee, before you engage them. Why it is a disease control policy? We are trying to prevent the transmission of disease from one person to the other. In the case where we've gone through this requirement successfully, and the employee 
the boss sick or ill, irrespective of the kind of illness or a communicable disease, you're saying that you should reshadow the person, move the person from that high risk situation to another area where the risk is low. But before you do that, you should do what is called risk assessment that is not going to continue that cycle with the transmission of diseases. Well, if you happen to have a minor cast, especially those in the cassava, I know when you are dealing with it, of cuts, dress it, and there is a bandage or a plaster that should be used. Dress the wound and report that to your production manager so that. And sometimes it will even become necessary to put a no entrance or ill persons or sick people, sick staff in certain areas of your location. When we are exposed or possibly exposed to a communicable disease, please report to your supervisor so that you can be reassigned or in the beginning day of awareness. These days and time, hepatitis is becoming an issue among factory hands. Tuberculosis, hmm? typhoid, dysentery, cholera, these are things that you keep on with, and therefore you have to manage them and manage them properly. So the plant manager or production manager should be involved in all the decisions about people who are sick and want to work in high risk areas. These diseases can be transmitted from person to person, and therefore, we have to, and we have examples, not too far away from us, and very recent, where the staff had the disease and was able to transmit, share. And that's a challenge. We should be able to do that. And please, you may, if you can afford, you have a decision to help you take decisions on all this. So that you'll be able to manage your diseases to avoid sanctioning from any of these regulatory agencies. Production practices keep clean or all cleaning materials away from the actual food or commodity that you are packing. Proper storage have designated storage areas for different things. Ingredients should be stored differently, packaging materials separately, and in cases where you have to rework or work on already finished product, you should store it separately. And please, it should be labeled appropriately. There should be a mechanism for what? Disability. Because you may not be able to control all the risk related to this kind of operation. You see at the top end of the slide, very beautiful finished product packaging. Okay. But pest control is lacking. So you see pest. Housekeeping is poor, and yet we have the state of the art storage facility. Please, ingredient containers must not be stored immediately adjacent to containers for waste or non-food products. Reason is that harborage, that is the hiding place for all these pests, unwanted friends. Non-product items should be stored separately and here I'm talking about physical separation of operations. That is what the code is talking about. So we store them. And in cases where they should be in the original container, please original container, I emphasize original container with the appropriate label. Don't remove the original label and put your own label. 
because there are certain pieces of information that should be there. If you take it off, you are creating serious challenges for your organization. If another authorized sanitary container should be used, please mark it clearly and state the use for that specific container. Ingredient identification and lot number or batch number traceability should be maintained. Containers must be properly closed, sealed, and covered to avoid contamination of the content. Now let's look at some of the good practices. You see the finished product warehouse, well arranged, we are talking about good logistic practice, good warehousing practice. You follow a certain orderly pattern of packaging or storing. Leave enough space for inspection. They should not be parked on the bare floor. They should be parked on pallets. And in case you want to use wooden pallets, they should be heat treated wooden pallets. There are challenges, practical challenges, risk. And I'm very much familiar with some of these challenges. Not any other pallet that you buy from Coco Bay. They should be treated. Why? Because there are insects in those pallets. They can affect your own. Life. See the one on the right, the way it is packaged. While they have all some of the facilities, the palace and all this empty cup. There are some other things within there. I intentionally produce this for you to tell me whether you agree with this kind of packaging as the best practice or it is okay, but it needs what improvement. There are several pictures, but time will not allow us to see all. They said clean and disinfect properly. Cleaning, disinfection, they are not the same. And even after disinfection, you want to sanitize because they have different purposes to accomplish. Water, please, the fact that you are cleaning, you are mopping your floor, production floors, or canteen, whatever, use clean water, not contaminated water. Sanitary handling of the equipment and the tools, the mop, the squeegees, the brushes, the mop buckets should be well segregated. And most often, I recommend that you use the color code so that you don't use the mop bucket or the brush for the washroom that you see for your production floor or the warehouse or the store. Mark them and train the people how to clean and clean well and disinfect, and how they should handle the cleaning equipment. The mops, do you hang it with the brush down and the handle up or the reverse? These are some of the practices that we have to, if you want to go into details, you need to train the sanitation, the janitors to do the right thing. Littering and other poor housekeeping practices are not permitted. And no code of practice will allow that. No code will allow that. Refuse must be placed in properly identified containers. Now we are even talking about segregation, plastic, bottle, paper, separate them so that you can dispose of them easily and appropriately. Toilet facilities, restrooms, canteens must be kept clean. Personal lockers, that paragraph in the model is a challenge to so many SMEs. We struggle to provide, but the employees 
for no reason in Bellevue. I have some terrible teachers, and these are real teachers, not testing staff. The kinds of things they put in the locker, personal lockers, you'll be shocked. Leftover KK, fish. And that's where you have to keep your clothes, your boots, your helmet, so that you don't contaminate. So you have a column for the one that you wear on the normal from home to up, and then you go into the training clothes. But instead of doing that, they are keeping leftover kinky in fish in the lockers. These are bad practices, it should not be allowed. Now let's look at it. Receiving, handling, and storage, and then the dispatching. You should have a protocol, a well-defined protocol to receive in consignment. Unloading bulk materials in the storage so that you don't end up contaminating your raw materials. And then the handling of the finished product or the semi-finished product, depending on your operation. So bulk ingredients will be properly transferred to some who need pipes, some who just physical transfer. Please make sure you do not contaminate the raw material. There also should be reliable and quality transportation service, not any cargo. Just go out there, hire any cargo to transport your finished product to either the warehouse or to the marketplace. Please consider certain things the temperature, relative humidity, the time that it will spend in transit to reach the destination, either by air, by air, most often by land. Please, if the track is so slow, and if you take it the whole day, 12 hours to transport your fruits from maybe it's home to Accra. Media to Accra is not good enough because of heat gain from outside during the transportation. Now, I've said so much, let's summarize it and call it the 13 golden rules. Keep hands clean. Keep nails short and clean. Sneeze and cough in disposable tissues. Now you can even add at your elbow. Wash hands after that. No false nails and nail varnishes. Please stop biting your nails. There are some people with a habit. Nail biting. Wounds, cuts should be covered. And here we prefer blue waterproof dressing. There are a lot of literature, the rationale behind the use of that. Keep your hair clean, and if you have long hair, the lady is tight before you wear your head neck. Perfumes and perfume creams and soaps are not allowed, especially in the food production environment. High risk. The reason is that you absorb for example, even the storage of the so-called purified sachet water. Sometimes you taste and it's like it mixed it with soap. It's because of how they store it in the presence of soap. Or very close to where they store soap. Jewelry, watches, rings, not be warm. It's not permitted. Nose, yeah, picking. West, not permitted. You know there are some people who are fond of picking their nose. Mm. No smoking, eating or drinking in food environment. Please, illegal in the European directives. These are some of your challenges. If you work with staff that are chain smokers, you may have issues. Even no smoking signs will not deter them. You have to enforce. The plant manager has to enforce. And encourage staff to report illness or sick as early as possible to their supervisor. Frequent and careful use of hygiene facilities as hand washing devices, boots. Some facilities have, you know, some boots, boots, sorry, boots washing or cleaning devices. 
please don't blow the whistle over food, especially when you're doing the packing. Some with their habits, they always want to sing or whistle when they are doing some of those things. Please don't bring those people or so called home clothes, bags, and shoes to the high risk areas. These are your 13 coding rules. Very easy to accomplish. Now, by way of conclusion, environmental hygiene, hygienic production of food and even, let's say, cosmetics and personal products because we are going to apply it on your skin. Handling, storage, proper transportation, cleaning, maintenance, personal hygiene, or if you like, personalize it for personal hygiene and the primary production are all necessary. Why am I saying that primary production are all necessary for ensuring quality, safety and access to the domestic because along the value chain if one of the links weak no matter how strict you are at the primary production level you transfer that contamination that risk along to the case of the final question and when the regulators are in there to check compliance you need to find and you be denied access to that particular market Thank you very much for your attention. Now, I'll leave these slides on because these are some of the literature and the reference material in terms of code the practices. Most of them can be downloaded free of time from Codex website. And there are some from GSA and FDA. Because you have to comply with these codes, make sure you have them at your disposal. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You very much. It's uh, Fred Jamna for such insightful and detailed presentation. Um, so Fred is done, he's taking us through, and I like how he summarized with the 13 golden rules. These are interesting golden rules. And uh, let's keep our hands clean, let's keep our nails shut, no biting, hair covered. And I think even COVID has even come to improve some of these things that were alien. Uh, to us. Um, so there are a few questions. Please, I still haven't gotten my question Q&A loaded. There's only one, but I guess others may come in. So the first question was, someone wants to know where he or she can get a heated pallets to buy, heat treated pallets to buy. Can I take him more as you answer this? Please answer this one. I, I personally don't want to promote somebody's business, but I can show you the location. There's a <laughs> very popular company at the Free Zones and in Tema. They are noted for the supply of these treated pallets. Not very expensive, and it's acceptable both locally and on the international market. They are using wood to treat it, but there are other companies that are doing but I don't want to mention specific names. So, but the location, if you are hard pressed, go to Tema Business and Trade. Right at the, the security point, they can point you to the place. And most companies are buying their nutritive products from them. Otherwise, okay. for the plastic one, which is very, very expensive. All right. Um, I would maybe also have a follow up to that. Assuming the fellow is in Kumasi or is in Tamale or is somewhere, where else? Do you have to travel all the way to Tema? Can you help us if you have a fair idea? I don't know whether they even have uh, branch offices or uh, their supply link there, but uh, maybe uh, one or two companies in Kumasi can help out with where they source those things out. Because this pallet thing is a very uh, if you like, important issue to requirement to comply with. Because you are talking about shrimp wrapping, and you shrimp wrap on a pallet. So you definitely need the wooden pallet, which is treated. Okay. Please, let me put a caveat here. Don't go and take the cocoa board used pallets, because they treat it with chemicals. 
and it is allowed. It is within their code that they use that. And they use that in only in their warehouses. When they are transporting, they don't carry the chemical. Okay. You see some white white fish, you know, pallets painted with some kind of chemical. Please it's for cocoa board only. Okay. Thank you. The next question is somebody wants to know that if you have to satisfy uh, GMPs, you need to satisfy both EU and Ghana regulations. Yes, uh, that is why I said code of practice is we are describing it as international best practice. It cuts across the geographical boundaries. Some places they should be overruled by their national regulations, like the FTA. Okay. But the basic requirements are all incorporated in this requirement. In the EU, we've done something before, we call it the market norms. And it's basically about this code of practices what is allowed and what is not allowed. For instance, traceability mechanism. If it's not there, please don't venture to go to the European market. Traceability. Yes. Very critical. Lot or batch number. Very critical. These are all part and parcels of the DNA. Okay. The living room. So it cuts across. Okay. Please, somebody wants to know how he or she can generate batch codes for a cosmetic product. There are several ways of generating code. Depending on your production or the operation, is it batch production or lot production? So your QA or quality control personnel should be able to come out. It's a code. Mm -hmm. So you can generate your own way of interpreting. You can use, you know, alpha America or just figures to sometimes they talk about the batch, mm -hmm. what the day, the time, and things like that. And now they have a lot of devices that you can put the information on and to print it on your product. But you set the default, like how you want to set your date on your computer. Okay. But the person who did that default setting to understand the meaning of the either the alphabet or the figures that you put on. So batch coding is an anyhow generated kind of mechanism. Yeah, right. Some use alphabet, some will use figures. Like Monday, if you have only one production. In a day, you can use A, B, C, D. If you are working seven, twenty-four, seven, then and like we you see a bag of precision, the letter A, it means that it was produced on the first day of the week. Okay, and sometimes they will tell you if it was a batch constitute one ton, they will put maybe you know thousand would means one ton, and then they will add certain things so they will know exactly how to trace back. The traceability principle is well, one step forward, one step backward. That's the principle. Okay. Because A is A, B is B. It can never be A, B. Okay. Correct. So I, I, I hope the explanation and the example given by Fred is would help us to be able to generate these codes. Somebody wants to know that uh, what all the things you talked about, about these good practices, is it the same things that the inspectorate bodies, when they come to their side, is it what they also look out for? I'm saying the same. And in addition to that, they are looking at the codes that has been generated by way of regulation. By way of? Their regulation, what their regulation says they should. For okay. instance, if you are in the primary production, okay, the code says you should have a hygienic facility, I'm talking about washroom, okay? When they come, do you have a washroom that can be described as acceptable? Because it's hygienic. If you say no, other code of practices you should have. They are saying you should have even a better form. 
So what kind of facility do you have in terms of hygiene, washing of hands? Eh? They say every worker should have a locker or a picking room assigned to you because you don't transmit diseases from the food. You have it. Yes, I have it. How do you keep it? Is it hygienic? These are the rules that are spelled out by the Casa Pro. So when they come, you may have the best in terms of taste and you know sensory evaluation, the best. But the conditions under which you produce is so bad they will never pass your program. Never. All right. Never. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so this is how it works. So in addition to whatever it is common, generic, they will also look out for their own specifics. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Mr. Jam, somebody wants you to re-emphasize on the cleaning habits needed in a warehouse for food production. First and foremost, you should not stack all the products. But let's use the finished product. Finished product, let's yes. Let's use example. Don't lump them together. Okay. There should be spacing in between the pallets. The stacking level for a certain height so that you can you use spacing. 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 What, what measurements can you give? Is it a meter apart? Just about 50, just about one foot. And then it should be all around so that, you know, the, if you are doing inspection for pests, you should be able to pick. So don't stack it against the wall. Okay? It should be stuck on the pallet, not on the bare floor. Okay? okay? The humidity and the temperature of the room should be monitored and controlled. Don't allow your curtains to sweat or they wear wet and they will lose their integrity. So you are monitoring the temperature and the humidity of the room. Okay? Basic housekeeping, cleaning. I don't want to find cobwebs all over the place. I don't want to find dust settling on your package products. And there one, those ones, you can easily examine. You touch the surface, you feel it, it's all dusty. Then the question will follow. How frequent do you clean? Because I told you that the cleaning protocol should be well established. Now we are talking about product tempering. The developed world is very critical because you are talking about what? Sabotage. Food defense mechanism. Can somebody have access to your finished product warehouse and contaminate? We are talking about adulteration. Deliberately contaminate. This is a serious thing. When you look at the literature, it's all over. If I drop cyanide, just one milliliter of cyanide into your finished product, do you know the harm that I've caused? Because you offended me, the HR offended me. So I want to do that. So we are talking about access control to your finished product where access control can be several things. Look, they are said, especially looking at your market requirement. Some will put about five different padlocks and share the keys about three people. So one or two cannot have access to the finish the appearance, access control. Some will install CCT cameras. So whoever goes in there, whatever you are doing. If you are using forklifts, what kind of forklift the machines I'm talking about? Are you using? Is it the gas? Is it a diesel engine operated or is it electric car? Okay. So you will see the markings to direct the traffic. So Finish with that. How is it separated from the packaging material or the raw material? The standard, there are several. The ISO TC, which is adopted by Ghana standard, is talking about you know, physical separation of activities. Physical separation. How you do the physical separation is so flexible. Okay? Prevention of dust. So you have to screen the windows. So sometimes you see that most warehouses don't have big windows. Yeah. Correct. Two reasons. The 
prevention of entry of pests and to minimize the dust. Because all this contamination will come from these foreign events. Okay, so there are two, three more questions, but I'll give you the first two and the last one in, in two different categories. So the first one, that somebody wants to know how they will continuously manage the wooden palace. I guess they're treated ones. How would they continuously manage it? And somebody also wants to know how they will manage the plastic uh, pallets as well. So if you take this one in a brief, I'll give you the second one, which is entirely different. The wooden ones, it depends on the buyer who is buying them. Some recyclable, they will take the product and bring your pallet back to you. Okay. If you walk down the streets, some timber market and the those industry, you see that they are selling used wooden pallets. Yeah. The buyer will only take the commodity and then dispose of the wooden pallets. Okay. The danger there, you don't know what they use the pallet to package. So naturally, they may be contaminated. Or it will dump in the uh, one site and somebody will just pick them up. So if it is a type that you, you have to do the maintenance in-house, OK? OK? And then make sure that whoever is returning those things will tell you how they handle it. Because we will not have the facility to do the heat treatment again. That is why people will not go for the one that you recycle. Because maintaining those heat treated wooden pallets is difficult. For the plastic one, you do it's part of your housekeeping, the washing. You clean and sanitize and reuse. That's it. So Thank you. If you are in the export, the advice go for the plastic one. Though you shall cost is high because you recycle it, they won't take it, they will bring it back to you. And when you come, you clean and reuse. Okay. The the last, one time all right. The last question is got to do with food grade paints. Somebody is asking if there are food grade paints for packaging process or processing units. Maybe you could also stress that for listeners so that they know what to do. Thank you. Food grade paints. In the food industry, almost everything, even the water hose, we have food grade. The food grade paint, the critical parameter is the lead content. Lead content, because we're talking about heavy metal. Okay, so any paint that has less lead content can be used. Two, it should not stick. It should have a very good adhesive property so that it will stick onto the floor or the wall. Okay, so right. if you get it and it, they declare the lead content, you can take a decision whether to buy or not to buy. Or ask the supplier to give you the material safety data. What did I say? Material safety data. Even when it comes to detergents and sanitizers, ask the supplier to give you material safety data, which is a very technical document that will tell you everything. How to use it, the application, the scope of application and all that. So if you see that it is not recommended for food establishment, go away, leave it, don't touch it. All right. Material safety data will tell you all those things. So source from the right place and ask the hard question. You tell them you want to know the lead content. If they have any lab report to show as a proof, take it along with you. Keep a copy on your record file. All right. Thank you very much, Fred. I think maybe also on the paints, knowing our system here, would you recommend or do you have any sources that you can direct people to? Because we see paint sellers all over. Can she everywhere? I mean, so where can we go and make sure we are getting the right grade? Please source from credible suppliers. Yeah, exactly. If I'm coming to buy things and you cannot give me that source document that I call material safety data, I will question your credibility. Okay. So there are several things, and then two. 
sometimes just the label information will tell you but to go into details and tell you this is not suitable for food operations or industries. Even even the water goes, they will tell you this are today because the material pesticide content is high and you transfer that into your material, your food. So please I cannot pinpoint, but because fraud, in terms of fraud, trade, and commerce is there, but open your eyes and demand for some of these things that will actually inform you whether. But there are several, and most of them they will tell you if it's from the good source, and the label will say it's not for this kind of application. And mind you, if you say it's for treating insects, insects and pests, it's telling you something that yeah. you can do harmful chemicals. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But we I just... cannot tell you to go to A or B, but I said go to the accredited suppliers of it. That's a simple answer. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, it's been a very good afternoon. It's been a very educative session as usual talking about food manufacturing practices and what we have to adhere to improve our food quality, food processing in our various um, units to avoid contamination and make sure that our products also break into other markets. Thank you so much, um, Fred, for taking us through this insightful presentation. So for listeners, we also thank you for joining in and we are certain that when the inspectorate division visit our various uh, production or processing units, we will qualify. Just like the question asks, are they going to ask these or more? And like Fred said, they're going, this is the basic. They may add on to the very basic. So let's do that. And then I like the last bit. He says, as a rule of thumb, if you are not sure, ask for the material safety data sheet for material that you are buying for your processing units in terms of even paints, which has also come for me as an educative part. I never even thought about it, but it is there for us to follow. So on behalf of the Wacom team, we want to thank you so much. Uh, we are into a new month um, of July. We thank you so much for being with us over the past months for joining all the webinars that we have done. Um, we ask you to keep safe. And for those who also joined us yesterday for the presentation on the subcontracting matching schemes, Please do send in your requests for the applications, the associations, and the various networks, and you will have the POC um, document sent to you on Monday, 6th July. And on this note, we want to thank all of you so much for joining us. Again, I always say get in touch with our experts. Fred is our expert on quality. Uh, get in touch with Na for cosmetics, Joseph for cassava derivatives, Frank for fruits, mango, and pineapple. We thank our other colleagues on the other side who you do not see. There's like a production team and they all play key role for us. Ebe who is not on camera. Ebe, thank you so much. Magde, Linda, who is also always after this, I know as we are here, she's tweeting, she's talking about us on social media. And our technical man, Nelson, who you never see, but always is also on hand to upload the videos on our website. So visit our website and follow and see all the webinars there. Follow us on social media on YouTube, follow us on uh, Instagram, on Facebook, Wacom Ghana, and our website, wacomghana.org. It's been a wonderful day, Fred. Have a pleasant weekend. And for all listeners, we say enjoy your weekend and stay safe. Be looking out for various platforms on which you get information and our next webinar would be advertised. On this note, we say thank you so much and have a pleasant and safe weekend. Bye-bye.